Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Joshua Frulinger. I am the editor-in-chief of Thinknum Media, our media outlet for Thinknum. Um, this morning and into the early afternoon, we're going to be talking about the shared economy with uh, two of the industry's, um, in my opinion, most interesting pioneers. And you'll see why in just a couple minutes. Um, so for a while, we were calling everything the Uber of something. It's the Uber of food, which sounds kind of gross. Uh, the Uber of this, the Uber of that. It was a thing that people used in order to sell their companies. And in some ways, it seems lately, we're calling everything the Airbnb of this or the Airbnb of that. And that points to a movement from a real fascination in the gig economy, which obviously has not disappeared, but into one that seems to be focused on what is happening in what we're calling the shared economy. Um, and Airbnb changed the way that we think about vacations. It disrupted the hotel business. Um, WeWork and Liquid Space have changed the way we think about workspaces. And now companies like CityBike and Revel are changing the way we think about actually getting around that sort of last mile. But there's confusion and information in this space when it comes to the shared economy. Uh, WeWork's tumultuous attempt to go public has made us all think twice about everything from scalability to overhead to investment and to burn. So let's talk about those things. Let's talk about scale with two of the industry's most interesting pioneers. Uh, first, we're talking to Paul Suhi. He's the uh, co-founder and COO of Revel, a shared electric vehicle company. He founded Revel in March of 2018 with a small pilot program in Brooklyn, which is, if you live in New York City, you probably see these things all over the place. They've now expanded into Brooklyn and into Queens. And most recently, uh, they've launched in Washington, DC, and just last week into Austin, Texas. We also have Mark Gilbreth. He's the founder and CEO of Liquid Space, the first end-to-end -end digital platform for flexible office procurement, combining powerful technology-driven solutions with real-time space availability across the industry's largest, most diverse marketplace for workspace solutions. He's been a veteran of the tech industry for over 25 years, and he seems to be figuring out in the office share space what we work couldn't. So thank you guys. Thank you for being here to talk about this. Um, first, I'd like the two of you to sort of introduce yourselves. Tell us about your, your companies and uh, how it fits in, in your opinion, into the, uh, the shared economy. So go ahead. Sure. Well, first, excited to be here. I think just to give everyone some context about Revel, what we do, what our goal is. So like a, a lot of other companies, we're a shared electric vehicle operator. But two things that we really do differently, one is the vehicle, and the second is the business model. So the vehicle that we focus on is an electric moped, an electric moped that has a license plate that's registered to the Department of Motor Vehicles, that's a street legal vehicle, meaning that it flows in the street, it rides in the street, it parks in the street, it does not go on sidewalks. Because it's a registered motor vehicle, it comes with full third-party liability insurance, it does not live in any sort of regulatory gray area. The infrastructure is already in place. So the unique thing about this vehicle is it can take car trips off the road, but it fits within an existing car world. So we don't need to lobby for protected bike lanes or anything of that nature. It sort of fits the city of 2019. And then with us as well, uh, business model for us, we actually don't use the gig economy to run our operations, whether it's mechanics, uh, charging the vehicles, customer service. We make a commitment to any city that we go into and run our operation with full-time employees. Um, so for us, it's about really trying to um, have a unique vehicle that is able to accomplish a lot of the goals that cities are working through right now, whether it's reducing congestion, reducing emissions, but doing a way that really works with the community in sort of a unique way. Thanks, Mark. Super. Um, so Liquid Space is a digital marketplace, uh, and our basic proposition is to let individuals and or teams, uh, it could be a startup or a large enterprise, be able to simply search, find, and book office space and meeting space by the hour, day, month, or year. Uh, but in any case, on a time scale that is inherently more flexible, shorter in length, than a traditional lease. Uh, and the, the kernel of inspiration for our business really came from the last recession which was real estate led. Uh, at the time, I was in the, in the regrettable position of uh, being a real estate developer after a long tech career. Uh, and, I, and I ran sort of head, headlong into sort of the enormous amount of underutilized real estate capacity in the office market. 
And uh, what became extremely clear was that uh, the traditional models of procuring real estate, signing long-term leases regardless of the requirement, and the inherent utilization of, os of office as an asset class were both very broken. On the, on the business model side, many companies and many individuals for many situations need space in smaller drips than a 10-year than a lease. And from an asset utilization standpoint, and when you consider, and we'll talk perhaps more about environmental and economic sustainability of the sharing economy, from an asset utilization standpoint, office is, is grossly underutilized. I mean, any given hour of any given day, the typical desk or office here in New York City is sitting idle 70% of the time, right? So, so we saw in a digital marketplace medium the opportunity to create more liquidity, more efficiency between supply and demand, and provide individuals and teams the ability to find it, book it with a click. So you're both playing in this space that we call the shared economy. And actually, now that I think about it, let's, let's take a beat and define what that means. How, in, in your opinions, does um, the shared economy differ from what we may consider the gig economy? What, what, what's different about it economically? Yeah, so in, in my opinion, when I think of shared economy versus gig economy, when I think shared economy, I think the utilization of assets. So either taking something that is existing and is underutilized, so say a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing system, 95% of the time a car is sitting on the street doing nothing. So you're just using that asset that is existing more efficiently. Or in our case, you're creating a model where you're putting vehicles or something on the road or doing some sort of hard asset that is being shared. So at the end of the day, it's being utilized more efficiently. So there's a difference there versus saying, I'm trying to utilize someone's time. So whether I have a certain skill set that I only want to work a certain amount of hours in the week or I have more flexibility. So gig economy to me relates more to someone's individual time versus shared economy sort of an, an assets utilization. So Mark, what we, we found some interesting data about liquid space. If we're talking about um, resources as something that's finite and the shared economy as a sort of uh, environment in which you give people access to those sort of resources. And in your case, you're talking about desk space and workspace. And um, we ran a story, I think, no media a couple months ago where we took a snapshot, an overhead snapshot of New York looking into, into Brooklyn. Um, and something that really struck me about your sort of outlay in, in terms of where you guys have inventory or where there's, there's desk space, um, for someone like myself or some of my colleagues who are writers living in Brooklyn or in Queens or something like that, we don't necessarily need to get some space from Regis or WeWork in Midtown because we're not doing meetings. But we might want to get away from our homes, we get away from our cat or whatever, and actually have some, some downtime and get some work done. What I find really interesting um, about your outlay is because of the way that your platform works, people can actually find spaces that are either near them or in sort of unusual spaces. What, it, what, how, I, talk to us a little bit about, how I guess, how that, how that works and where your inventory comes from. Sure, and, and I'll, I'll just a quick, let me start by just adding a quick uh, additional element to, to his answer with regards to what defines sure. the economy. Asset utilization is, is a fundamental pillar of it. I also believe that in most sharing economy, economy businesses, there's also to the consumer, to the user, there's sort of a disruptively exciting utility, right? Like you're, you're, in, you're, you're providing convenience and or experience in a way that otherwise wouldn't have been achievable. And so in our case, as evidenced by your, your data map, nice, nice uh, data collection, um, the, the, the radical utility is work wherever you want to, <laughs> you know, whenever you want to, right? And so we had already seen this emerging pattern of people increasingly leaving work to get work done. You know, who, 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 who isn't working everywhere and much of the time? And the exciting opportunity was to try to then marry you know, a warm, clean, well-lit, appropriate space wherever you might be, whenever you might need to do work. And so, you know, it's the combination of those two things, the utility to the consumer and then a fundamental model of making assets more utilized that, that led to that map. And that, that, that map, the, the other sort of aspect of our business as a marketplace is one of aggregating supply, right? So, you know, Regis, most companies have heard of, it's been around for 25 plus years, well-established player, 
3,000 locations around the planet. We work high rise, you know, high flying company, lots we could talk about there, 500 locations around the planet. <coughs> but the reality is there are tens if not hundreds of thousands of points of presence where work happens. And so the exciting play is to aggregate all of those places and put them in one app, mm -hmm. put them on one platform. So someone could find space that might be leased or it could uh, uh, buy an office manager or it could be something that's even within WeWork's inventory. Yeah, and, and much, much like you might go into Expedia today or any other OTA and see not just hotel inventory, but you're also gonna see Airbnb and, and HomeAway and others. So there are multiple different derivatives in the office asset landscape that we're aggregating. You know, we've aggregated every one of the co-working and serviced office names, you know, the, the, the Regis, WeWork, and hundreds of others. But we're also unlocking uh, idle inventory that otherwise would have perished that sits inside the offices of private companies that have done traditional leases. Right. I got 10 extra desks at the Revel office and I want to monetize it you know, by the day, by the week, by the month. So, um, th th these, so, so these aren't your offices, so that's, that's a perfect segue to um, talking with you, Paul, which is, which is very different. You're playing in the same space, but you've got this fleet of electric mopeds that are currently all over Brooklyn and all over Queens. Um, and that strikes me as the fact that you guys are playing in the same space, but these are uh, very different business models. Your overhead is actual physical things that you have created a resource and then you're moving it around. Um, so I wanted to talk about this story that we ran about you guys where we actually discovered in your hiring data. And I wanna to talk to you about how you decide where to launch and, and what that looks like and what sort of, uh, uh, I guess, strategic decision-making goes into that. We discovered uh, a bunch of job listings a couple months ago in uh, your hiring data because we're looking at you know where you're posting jobs and that kind of thing, and um, all of a sudden you guys had a bunch of jobs in Texas. You called it I think you called it Texas City or something like that. You had to choose somewhere. You had to choose somewhere, um, and we discovered that you were gonna we we were pretty sure that you were gonna be launching in Texas pretty soon because the company isn't gonna start hiring people in that location unless they plan on doing something there, especially if you have physical assets. Um, so two questions there. One is um, why Texas? Uh, like what goes into that? I saw Mark was asking about that a little bit earlier. Yep. Um, and then what, that sounds like a logistical uh, uh, terror in a lot of ways, like just firing up an operation like that. You're talking warehousing and, and servicing and that kind of stuff. So why Texas and, and what's going into launching there right now? Yeah, so we, you can imagine we get that question a lot. So the question is typically phrased, what data points are most important to you when you think about expansion? And usually it's a leading question. So they'll say, is it population density? Does it fall in this range? And if it's above this, then it's a go. Or maybe it's weather, or maybe it's car ownership or demographics. And really when we think about expansion and thinking about expansion to Austin, Texas, for us it starts with a really binary decision. It's does the city want us? And I think at the end of the day, we talk a lot about the consumer and how that process works and our relationship to them. But for a lot of you know, us that work within the shared economy, you, you operate within a city, you operate within a community, and you have to convince that you are a value add to that city, to that community. So for us, the way that we approach expansion is we have early conversations, proactive conversations. We meet with regulators, we meet with pol politicians, we meet with advocacy, advocacy groups, and we really try to understand the unique goals, what they're trying to accomplish, what their pains are, what their current options are. Uh, so for us, expanding to Austin, Texas, if you look at Austin right now, more than 80% of residents that live in Austin commute to work by car. And if you think about where their goals are, they're trying to reduce that number to 50% by 2039. So understanding that context in which we're operating, we can have a conversation, talk about our experience in New York, talk about our experience in DC, and say, we fit within that overall goal. So we're on the same page of what the mission is. Now let's get into the weeds of how this service works. So that's sort of how we think about expansion, going into cities, making sure that we're having those conversations and making sure that we're a wanted addition to, to their city. So on the logistics front, um, you, you were hiring both, it looked like uh, you know warehouse workers and then also service people and that kind of thing. And it sounds like what you're doing is you're sort of front loading the, the customer service uh, angle or the, or the customer experience, if you will, and I want to talk to both of you about um, uh, the customer experience in the shared economy because 
um, you don't necessarily have that sort of uh, in-person um, customer touch point, right? Unlike a lot of other businesses, if you're opening a restaurant or something like that, you know your front staff, you know they're gonna be interacting directly with customers. In your case, you know, Mark, you've got uh, offices um, that you don't necessarily control. You don't know how often they're being cleaned. And in your case, yeah, you, you have service people and that kind of thing, but you're not necessarily there as they get onto the scooter or to the moped and, and they ride away. So I, I guess starting with your, with your roll up in, in um, Austin or other places, you know, that focus on, on servicing and what goes into that, and I guess, you know, mark how you guys think about trying to, uh, I guess, maintain control of that. Quality. Yeah. yeah, so for us, there's a major focus on safety. And so there's a couple of reasons why we made this decision, but with such a focus on safety, we think that in order to have a fleet of vehicles that is well-maintained, that is safe to ride on a consistent basis, we need a workforce that is well-trained, well-paid, uh, well and just well-treated. And the interesting thing about our business model, and we tell all of our employees this, we have a customer service organization and we have an operations organization, but at the end of the day, everyone works in customer service and everyone works in operations. So for us to be able to operate our fleet efficiently, a lot of the intake of problems, of issues, of questions and concern come from customers. So our customer service organization has to take that feedback and then translate it to operations. So you can see how the communication flow, if not done efficiently, can create a lot of extra work, can create a lot of concerns if you don't have a really unique connection there. And just understanding that at the end of the day, if that workforce you know, isn't well-trained, isn't full-time, isn't properly incentivized, then we don't think we can do everything that we can as a company to just ensure the, the proper maintenance of the vehicles in which we operate. So you're doing everything you can to, to try to at least have a hand in that or, or control it. So, Mark, you have a, a very different challenge here in, in my estimation, right? Indeed, I mean, um, in some ways, Paul's business is enviable in that he's got a uniformity of the supply, right? He's, he's got a exciting sharing business, but with a one-sided kind of go-to-market strategy, I might suggest. Uh, ours is inherently two-sided. We have supply and demand. And on the supply side of our business, it's actually even more complex because there are three distinct types of, of property that are coming into our platform. We've got the co-working spaces and serviced offices like Regis and WeWork and Convene and Notel and Marriott et al. Um, you know, in the business of space, we've got institutional building owners like EQ and Tishman and Brandywine and Washington Reit and others. And then we've got a third category, which is private companies sharing space. And the service delivery sort of resources of those three animals are, are very different. You know, you know, WeWork and Convene and Notel and Regis are in the business of space. They, they are hospitality companies fundamentally. So you know, in terms of, of how we merchandise them and how a customer chooses, that's, we, we have high confidence of their ability to deliver. The private company sharing a desk by the month or an extra office by the month, that might be a, a less quality controlled experience. So, so we've got, we have to, part of what our platform has to do is provide for, uh, an accurate representation of what you're gonna get when you book. You know, sort of like Airbnb. The other dynamic is how do we then best inform? What data, what information needs to be at the hands of the consumer to make a good transactional decision? And we rely on sort of proven mechanisms like the wisdom of the crowd. So ratings and reviews are a part of that critical data set. And we've also evolved more recently into providing additional curation tools. So our customer might be an individual employee working on the go who needs a meeting room in Brooklyn, or it might be an employee at Genentech and the Genentech real estate department set up liquid space to be the platform that all their employees use. And so we're, we're now enabling you know, organizations to, to curate inventory, to choose criteria that they wanna use to pre-filter the options that might show up. So, but in, in order to, to know these things, you're looking at you're both, I imagine, looking at usage data and you're adjusting in as real time as possible, right? So if you see that you know, in the voice of the crowd, for instance, is, is problematic in a certain area with a certain thing, you're gonna, you're gonna make adjustments and either remove them from inventory or you're gonna talk to them, right? Yeah, so it, you know, it's a digital marketplace. Right. Uh, the general user experience is one of, uh, I need a four person team space in Brooklyn starting on January 1st for six months, or I need a meeting room next Thursday 
uh, at Fifth and Madison, right? You know, um, and our, you know, we, we have hundreds of thousands of spaces in the platform, so our algorithms are looking at things like reviews and the property's responsiveness and their conversion rate, as well as other filtering criteria the user might put in to order the results. So right. we're, fundamentally, we're, we're a dating service. We are trying to best match and best delight the end user by understanding both the, the heuristics of how, the, how those properties have performed, as well as what the user has told us, mm -hmm. and what we can infer from the user's sort of demographics that we know will delight them. Right, and, and then Paul, um, I, I have a question for you, kind of a, b a bone to pick with you, just a little bit. So I live in Brooklyn, where you guys launched, and, 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 I want, and, I, and my first interaction with Revel outside of, of riding um, a moped was waking up on a Saturday and being, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ride, and I pull open the map, and there's the closest one is like, I don't know, like a mile away. And they're, they're, and people will say this, and, and they move to the outside of Brooklyn and Queens because people like myself who live in the middle of Brooklyn are trying to get to other places, obviously, where, where uh, mass transit doesn't, uh, doesn't meet. So I, I'm curious how you guys monitor that data. I know you have people whose jobs it is to, to re-sort of set them, but what, what, what is that? What does that sort of data watching or data mining in real time look like for you guys? What is that process? Yeah, I mean, first it sounds like we need more mopeds, which is, <laughs> which is a good sign. Um, it's a work in progress. I think in any, any company that operates in our space, whether it's a docked model like City Bike, it's uh, dockless like a car to go like us, uh, it's a challenge. Um, so that's one reason if you think about pricing models, a lot of people ask the question of when will you introduce some sort of membership model? And we made the decision early on where until we can ensure some level of consistency and reliability, it makes sense for us to really just be sort of a pay per use because it's very difficult to provide a consistent service. You go to Netflix, you go to Amazon, you have a consistent routine and you know what to expect. With Revel, you don't always know that there will be one, one block away, two block away, blocks away, three blocks away. So for us, it's really, and this is sort of an advantage of being a first mover, you have a, a unique vehicle that hasn't really been used at this scale on US streets, on New York streets. So over time, you start to learn more about usage, about trends, and I would really put us as a company right now more in the collection phase, where we need to you know, test different things, we need to understand how do people use this service, what are the trends, how do those trends vary by by weather, by time of day, by weekday versus weekend. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's really trying to make sense of that data, uh, run tests, so then we can understand how does it make sense to make this a little bit more efficient at scale, doing unique things like, like a Bike Angels and City Bike, where you're incentivizing users, where if you go to this neighborhood or if you park this vehicle two or three blocks away, we'll compensate you in some sort of way. And then, but it all starts with just understanding the information and collecting that information first. One thing that I hear um, a little bit from, from both of you that, that's interesting to me is when we talk about um, you know, the consumer or the end user or, or someone who is sort of making this decision to, you know, to rent a moped or to, to get some space for a couple of hours, um, there's a, there, there seems to be a customer education process, if you will, that goes into this, right? Yours is obvious, like how to ride a moped and not kill yourself. Um, yours is, is, you know, where to find it, how to check in, you know, kind of similar to, to Airbnb. I remember the first time I, you know, rented an Airbnb, I think it was in Tokyo or something like that, and it was kind of scary. It was different than walking into a hotel and walking into a shared office space is, is very different. And there's, there's an upfront customer education process, and I'm curious how you guys think about that. And it's also it's it, it's not just upfront. It's it's it, it can evolve over time. I mean, when we first launched, actually in Austin, Texas, some years ago, our solution at the outset was meeting rooms or desks by the hour or by the day. It's like open table for meeting rooms. Period. Um, later in our growth, we expanded into supporting longer term transactions, space by the month or year. And so Salesforce.com wants a regional sales office in Dallas, Texas, for three years. They don't want to sign a long term lease. That was a liquid space transaction. Uh, you know, ServiceNow, Oracle, Airbnb. So, so, so it's not just that meeting room by the hour on the go. And, and markets have memory. <laughs> so, so one of the challenges that we just face as a, from a marketing standpoint is evolving the market's understanding of, hey, this platform, this flexible office economy platform, 
can now solve not just for the meeting room you want touching down in Boston or in Brooklyn for the afternoon, but it can also be the outright alternative to how you actually procured your day-by-day, month-by-month office. Yeah, and, and so for us, I think, um, repeat the question one more time. How, how are you educating yeah. the, the consumers when you, yeah. know, you make that so, choice to hop on a moped? Yeah. So for us, it's a lot of, a lot of this business is timing. And so if you think about, you know, first, just the vehicle itself, you know, two years ago, you had an electric moped that cost twice as much, that got half the range. So now the vehicle is in the right place. And I, that same concept really relates to the consumer education process, where if we started this business 10 years ago, people would say, what? Like, they just wouldn't get it. But now you have something where in the context of the industry of just consumer education with other types of businesses, whether it's Uber and Lyft, whether it's Bird and Lime, it's Bike Share, people really intuitively understand the process of downloading an app, finding that vehicle on the app, using the, the app to unlock, to turn it off. They just understand that process. So for us, we've had the unique advantage of being able to put vehicles on the road, and consumers see that and intuitively know what to do. But it also goes back to sort of our model of going to a city, committing to a city, being really boots on the ground. Because there's an element of we need to convince you as a consumer to use this service, what's the value to you. But we also need to convince the community that there's a value add. Because at the end of the day, if we get 13, 15 rides a day, it doesn't matter if the person, uh, the business owner, the resident that doesn't use the service doesn't see the value to it. So we have this dual challenge of educating consumers on what's the value, uh, why should they use it, but also making sure that we're doing our diligence, doing our work, and being boots on the ground of just educating the general ecosystem of which we operate. And, and that's, that's interesting to me because customers are going through their own, um, or potential customers are going through their own sort of internal ROI, if you will, right? So if, if I'm thinking like I got to get from from my place in you know, Bed-Stuy to, to Williamsburg, for instance, for the most typical hipster scenario ever. But um, I'm thinking on a Saturday, like, do I jump on the G train for $2.75, or do I grab a Revel for around the same cost? But I'm thinking about a lot of things. I'm not just thinking about costs, I'm thinking about the experience. That's gonna be a lot more fun than sitting on a dank yep. you know, a G train on a Saturday afternoon, so how, how do you guys think about that sort of that, or do you think about that that sort of internal ROI that customers are going through? Because it comes down, at the end of the day, it comes down to cost. But I think in a lot of ways, it also comes down to to yeah. experience. And yeah, I, I really like the way that you approached it earlier. Of really understanding, a customer makes a decision on on two main factors. There's the utility, yeah. which in our business model is sort of affordability and price and cost and time. So how long does it take you to get there? And then there's the experience factor. Uh, what are the intangibles of getting on an electric moped? Wind in your face versus sitting in the back of an Uber pool, sitting in the back of the Uber, you're just providing a different experience that's really hard to quantify. Mm -hmm. So the way that we sort of pitch our service to consumers that, are, that we're talking to for the first time is it's a third of the cost of an Uber and twice as fun. Like, it's pretty simple. But it, it's definitely, I think, a lot of these um, shared economy business models that you pointed out, rightfully so, just provide a different level of experience that is above and beyond just the general ROI of cost or time. Sure. So in our in our final minute here, I, I would love for the two of you to um, wax poetic, if you will. Like, it, assuming that everyone and it looks like everyone has sort of crossed the threshold, right? Across the great divide, um, and. They're on board. They get it. They're into sharing. They're they're hopping on on a on a moped. They're grabbing an office space for a couple hours. They're renting an evening gown for a Saturday night. All these things exist. So what what does this future look like? Am I being crazy when I say like is is the sense is the 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 concept of ownership um, is that is that moving? Is that goalpost moving? I'm, I mean, auto manufacturers are talking about. Um, just uh, you know, subscription models for, for cars, even going beyond just the, the simple lease model. What, what does that future look like to you guys? Uh, well, in office, the, the flexible office economy, as we're now framing it, as it's being framed, um, has an extraordinary sort of decade ahead of it. 10 years ago, it was about 1% of office stock. 
and you know, a $5 billion interesting profitable industry, and Regis was the big name 10 years ago. Uh, today it's grown to, here in New York City, about 3.7% of office stock uh, is now allocated to flexible office models. Whether that's a landlord selling a spec suite, whether that's a WeWork selling a, a desk or a glass box by the month, or a, or a, or a Regis. Um, the outlook for the next 10 years is that's gonna grow to between 20 and 30% of corporate tenancy and office stock. So we're looking down the barrel at a 10X swing in terms of how the $3 trillion office economy is transacted. Today, just to summarize today, 97% of all office transactions happen on 10-year paper leases. Uh, and and you know, three or 4% happen via license agreements and, and more flexible terms. That's gonna grow 10X. So um, enormous implications economically and environmentally around that because what we haven't talked about, and we should in every conversation, is there are extraordinary sustainability implications of Paul's business, of our business. And so I think that's an important thing to, to keep attention on. So Paul, what about you five, 10 years down the line? What does your space look like? Yeah, I, I think the really exciting thing, um, being a part of this industry, being a part of this space, is it's really, it comes down to the breakdown of, of the car. So you think about a vehicle that is used for almost every trip in the US, so 60, 50%, depending on the market in which you operate, of trips less than five miles are fulfilled by a car. So you have this vehicle that is almost like a decathlete. So it's kind of good at a lot of different things. It's not really great at one thing. And so you have this unbundling of this vehicle from a car to bikes, to electric bikes, to scooters, to electric mopeds, to different modes that just operate uh, in a more sustainable and a more equitable way for a lot of different communities. So I think you'll continue to see innovation around that, around different vehicle types. I mean, if you just look at you know, Uber getting into bikes and scooters, Lyft getting into scooters, it's just clear that there's this, this push to understanding that the car has done a lot of damage to cities. Cities are continuing to grow. So we have to sort of flip this model on its head and give consumers, give cities new and innovative options to get around and you have vehicles and and services that can provide that uh, flexibility right now. I like that feature.